Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. There are many of you sitting here today who know that not only that I have a little dog, but you have met the little dog. He's, he's about this big. He's called Zalman. Um, and recently, I had to teach him to do something new because he was getting so excited when I came home because uh, I spend quite a bit of my time here, as you may imagine, and he, he misses me. Um, and he was getting so excited when I came home that the inevitable consequences would ensue. Um, so after a little bit of internet research, uh, I taught him the command calm. I, I would just stand there with my hand up and I would say calm. And after a while he got it and he, he kind of hunkers down. He lies down and he's still. And after he's, he's been calm and he's put himself properly down, um, then he gets petted and fussed over and, and so on and so on. And he's a smart little dog and he learned how to do calm reasonably fast, but it's much harder for him to keep down once he's got down because the tail is a giveaway, yeah? The little tail is ticking away on the top. And even though he's flat on the floor and ostensibly calm on the outside, he's ready to jump up again. And the second I take my eyes off him, he's zooming around the apartment again. Um, and I think that is probably because he cannot stand waiting. And, and I wonder, we learn a lot from our pets, I think, and I wonder how many of us can actually bear to wait for anything at all, really. Uh, how many of us can't bear to stand in line at the supermarket before our feet start to tap and the phones come out and we, and we start that sighing that is characteristic of people who are waiting, you know, the, yeah? How, how many of us, can't deal with badly phased red lights. And, and we wait, I think, as human beings, we wait for bigger things as well. We wait and we wait for healing after a bereavement or a trauma or a crisis or an illness. We wait for a child, we wait for a partner, we wait for the phone to ring with that call to tell us that the job of our dreams is finally within our grasp. We wait and we wait. And I'd like to invite you to take a moment, just a moment, to think of something that you are waiting for or something that you have waited for in the past and just focus for a moment, remind yourself just how challenging that process is or was. Has everybody got something? I thought so. And to be fair, it, it would appear from this week's Torah portion that waiting is not in our genes, not, not in the genes of the Israelite people who became the Jewish people. We would appear, as they say, to have been behind the door when patience for that whole waiting thing got handed out. And as we read in the Torah this morning, I'm going to quote, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. For the children of Israel waiting for deliverance, for all those who were standing there with them, waiting to see what happened next, for Moses who was in charge of the whole brigade, for all of us here today, the question is the same question, why is it so hard to wait. And there are a number of ways, I think, that we can answer the question. We can say that we live in an unprecedented age of instant gratification. Think for a moment just how often you get impatient when the little wheel appears on the computer because it's taken more than about half a second to click through to the page that you wanted to click through to. 
And as I know to my cost, and I'm sure there are those in the room who are the same, we can buy anything we want in a matter of seconds and half a dozen clicks, and we can have it packed up and on the way to us within hours. And so we very rarely these days have to endure the state that my friend and colleague, Rabbi Julie Pelt Adler, rather, rather evocatively calls the wanties. You know, when you really, really want something, and it isn't coming. It's rare for us to have to wait, and perhaps that makes the waiting process harder when we have to. But I think there are other things that make it hard as well, and those difficulties are not so much external. Those are the, diff those are the difficulties that are generated, as it were, between here and here. Yeah? So there's a blog, Thoughts That Move, and there's an author, Wendy Payne Miller, uh, who listed out some of these difficulties. So for some of us, being forced to wait invites us to make comparisons. I have to wait for this thing, but there's somebody over there and they're not waiting for it, and that makes me feel bad. Or perhaps our feelings of entitlement to something are getting frustrated. I should not have to wait for this. I am a good person. I've got however many university degrees I've got, and that means that I should have what I want now, and I should not have to wait for it. And there are some of us for whom waiting makes us shut down completely. We're so bored that we become paralyzed, and it's one way of dealing with all of those feelings. And others of us, like the children of Israel in today's Torah portion, waiting is something that simply engenders fear, various kinds of fear. If I don't get what I want now, then I'm never going to get it ever. Or if I don't get what I want now, then I've made plans, and those plans are going to get upset because if this doesn't happen, if I don't catch the bus, then I won't catch the train. If I don't catch the train, then I won't catch the plane. If I don't catch the plane, then something appalling is going to happen, and I can't stand it. Get me to the front of this line right now. Yeah? It's fear. It's panic. And, and, and that is what we saw in the Torah portion today. And I think what links all of those various mental states together is, is the loss of control. That when we are waiting for something, we simply cannot do anything about it, except sit there and wait, and wait, and wait, and wait for the change that seems to be so long in coming. And I think that today's Torah portion teaches us two possible approaches to what we might call the agony of waiting. And one of those suggestions comes from Moses, and the other one comes actually from God. So to take Moses' suggestion first, he addresses the people, they're standing, hopping up and down in that passage that I just read, and he says, Hityatsvu, be still. Stand still. Stop fussing, stop worrying, stop complaining, stop panicking, and be still. And, and the root of that word, hityatsvu, is also the word that gives us the word, uh, the root that gives us the word matseva, which is a monument. And, and I'm reminded of that beautiful line from Shakespeare that goes, she sat like patience on a monument smiling at grief. Uh, and if you prefer an image that is a little bit closer, I watched Crossing Delancey again over the break. Beautiful movie, if you haven't seen it, um, of a, uh, a shidduch and uh, a booby who is making a shidduch with the, with the man that the heroine should actually be marrying rather than all the men that, that, she's, uh, that she's dating. And, and there's a point where the booby sits him down and says, you have to wait around. You have to wait around like a piece of furniture. And, and it's that. Both of those are hityatsvu. Both of those are standing still. And, and the message, I think, the message that is underlying it is that we can deal with waiting by understanding that valuable things are going to take time and that being in a state of inner turmoil is not going to help and that the waiting process is going to take just as long as it takes and not a second shorter. And it will help if we can be still. It will help if we can be calm until that waiting process 
comes to an end. So that's one approach, hitiasfu. But there's another one, and it's a suggestion which comes from God. What happens is that Moses says to the people, stand still and wait, and then Moses turns to face God. And without Moses saying anything at all, which I feel is very unfair, God says to Moses, what are you yelling at me for? Matitzakalai. Yeah, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. And, and that approach, the Matitzakalai approach, if, if I can call it that, involves taking some kind of step within the actual process of waiting. Yes, we've got to wait, but the fact that we've got to wait doesn't mean that there are no initiatives that we can be taking. There is probably a place within any given waiting situation where we can grab hold of the initiative and do something. And there's that midrash, there's that, that interpretation that many of us know, set at the Red Sea when the waters are up to here, but Nachshon ben Aminadav, the prince of the tribe of Judah, goes striding into the water. That's a matitzakalai approach because he's not going to wait around for the water to go down. And there's another midrash as well, which teaches that unless we take the first step ourselves, if we do not take the initiative, then the next step won't happen. It's set in terms of the, pe of the people and God. And, it on, and when the Torah says, why do you cry to me? Rabbi Yoshua teaches that this is like somebody who is a beloved friend of a king. And if that friend has something to deal with it, he, he brings it to the king. And he says, please do this for me. And the king says, why do you cry to me? Why are you yelling at me? Matitzakalai, do what you need to do, and I will ensure that it happens. Which is exactly what God is saying to Moses here. So the message underlying this second approach is that even though we're waiting, we don't have to be helpless because there will always be something inside the situation that we can do, even though the situation as a whole is something that we're unable to control. And there are reflections of that lesson, not just within Judaism, but outside Judaism as well. Um, there is a, a, a contemporary writer called Carolyn Miss, and she writes, I, I'm, I'm thinking as I'm standing here, should I be bringing you this quotation? But I think I have to because it is just so beautiful. She writes, in many ways, the spiritual challenge of waiting and becoming a different quality of person makes more of a contribution to this world than financing a new hospital. This may be difficult to understand we are unaccustomed to giving value to what we cannot see, and we cannot see the power emanated from a healthy psyche. Thus, those whose work is waiting and becoming can often appear useless. But I have yet to find a person pursuing a path of conscious awakening who has not experienced a time of waiting during which his or her interior is reconstructed. And as with all matters of the spirit, once we start along the path, there is no turning back. And what she's teaching, I think, is that waiting is necessary. There is something about the process of waiting that kind of raises our spiritual temperature it, it's necessary for our development, that, that old adage of the butterfly in the cocoon, and you can't put a hairdryer under the cocoon to make the process faster, because if you do, then what you're going to get is a disabled butterfly. As for that, so for us, waiting is a necessary part of human existence. And perhaps that is what we should be learning from this morning's Torah portion. There are things that we can do, but ultimately, the waiting is still there. And of course, the children of Israel are not going to learn that over and over again in the Torah. They get themselves into trouble precisely because of their inability to wait. 
But for us, for us sitting here this morning, thinking back to what we said we were waiting for at the outset, think back again to what I asked you to think about at the beginning and see if the Torah can shine light on your waiting process. Remember, there were two things. Hityatzvu, the idea that you need to be still, the idea that you need to stay with it, the idea of quieting your turmoil so that you can wait better, and the idea of matitz ak alai, that there is something you can do even though you can't control your waiting, that there will be some seed within that process of waiting that you will be able to get hold of and move your process forward. Hityatzvu, stick with it. Matitz akalai, move it forward. For all of us this morning, I hope that the Torah can teach us to wait well. Shabbat Shalom.